Yes, g'day. Welcome. Another Monday, another week. But what's different on the Shelter Footy Cast? West Coast of bloody one. In both grades, mind you. I'll tell you what, that's big news over here in the West, Skeeter. And uh, got to be honest, uh, as you know, I'm not a West Coast fan, but it felt good being able to see uh, a Western Australian side win at Optus Stadium, and that being West Coast for once. 47,000 fans there. Let's be honest, Richmond were banged up, but you can only beat what you're up against. And that look, thought they were very good yesterday. So, yeah, there's mixed feelings in WA about the two clubs. Fremantle supporters would be absolutely filthy Spewing. about another defeat the way that unfolded. Not the umpire's fault this time, mind you, although there was no, a late there was decision. a couple. There was a couple, couple in that last but not quarter. as definitive as the week before. I will say, though, that the Eagles... Uh, will take great heart from that. The Waffle side won on the same day. That's the first time since July 2021 that both teams had won on the same day. West Coast Waffle hadn't won for like 600 days. No, and they beat East Ramal, the running premiers. Go figure. So, uh, you know what? I think it's terrific. The club's been through, uh, like all the Eagles, they've been through a lot of hard times. It's not the new dawning. They're going to win six in a row, in my opinion. But, but they're only two games outside the eight. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, Shelter Footycast live from Backchat Studios. Follow us on social Shelter Footycast, wherever you get your stuff there. Now, uh, Skeeter, a little last push here and a last call for flights to the Gold Coast. Mm. So off the back of a big win, can West Coast win on the Gold Coast? Well, you can be there to watch it. You can get flights on the plane with the players, two tickets, thanks to our good friends at Travel and Sports Australia. Uh, just jump on backchatstudios.com.au and you can enter there. We're going to run it up until midday and we'll announce the winner this afternoon. Afternoon, Skate. So if you're on early and you're listening right now, you do have one final chance to enter for your chance to go, I don't know, get over the Gold Coast, get some sun, Skate. Nothing wrong with that. Good spot. And if you don't take that opportunity, I'll certainly jump over there. I've got free accommodation. Good spot. <laughs> uh, and the Suns are playing good footy and hopefully the Eagles can... Go okay in the derby and go up there with some confidence. Okay, I like that, Skeeter. And we'll be live at the Leaderville Hotel on Thursday. This Thursday, Josh Kennedy, Matt Pavlich, you and I, Hamish Brayshaw. There's a world record set to be broken on this one, Skeeter. Can't announce what it is yet, but we need uh, around 100 people to do it. So Hamish Brayshaw, who's been doing hammer breaks, breaking a world record every week, he'll be attempting live at the Leadable Hotel. Given he's playing well for footy, it's not going to be alcohol-related. It's a buy this week for East oh. Perth, Skeet. So I tell you what, there's a few East Perth boys coming down. If you haven't got your tickets, I will say this is a last call for these. It will sell out. Oh, that's, see, everyone says that. Tickets are limited. Um, I know, I'd, I'd like to talk our events up, oh. but... Oh, I'm sorry, it's, it's not an unlimited space. We're not ha- hosting an Optus Stadium. We can't have 50,000 people down at Leadable Hotel. I mean, we're very close. We can't have 50,000 down there. We're not that popular, Sky. No, we're talking about You're not. You're certainly... Well, you actually are. <laughs> Tell you what, uh, if you'd love to... We'd love to have you down there. The Backchat Owl relaunch and derby special at Leadable Hotel. Tickets in bio or on backchatstudios.com. Today, you Will Schofield, Mark Redding, Shell Footy Cast. <laughs> All right, Skeet, uh, we did speak about West Coast off the top, but huge for the footy club that they win that and get that done. We'll get into those games in a little bit. A couple of incidents over the weekend I thought worth chatting about. Zach Butters v Bailey Banfield. Zach Butters clear of any wrongdoing and he will not be suspended. Was he fined? It was nothing. It wasn't even a free kick. That shows you how. <laughs> and I was calling the game at the time and I said, hit high, Butters, no free kick. Wow, that was just out of the box that not one of the four umpires saw him taken high. Now, Butters was going for the footy, but given what we've seen in recent times, now, Banfield played on, but the contact to the head, was he going for the footy? Irrespective, I thought Butters deserved to at least face some sort of penalty for, for what he instigated. There's two things here. How do we feel about the incident? And then how do we feel, like, you know, the, the specific incident? And how do we feel about the game right now and how this is being adjudicated? So I think the incident, oh, I really loved it. Zach Bart is, like, hard. Like, to mm. come in that hard for a ground ball, just I, I, I've got to respect that. I think Bailey Banfield did his best as well. I don't think either shirked the issue. Now, was he caught high? Yes. Do we want this in the game? I would like to think, yes, I would think there, so, is so, room. So, there is room for a player to come in hard and incidental contact to be made high. Incidental? Pro- well, I think it's inter- incidental. He's going for the footy. That's so, what incidental is. But that doesn't is. matter because if, if... That's incidental. But if Banfield goes to ground and he's concussed, this bloke's gone, Butters has gone for weeks. It's, still, he inci- to, it's, it's, still, it's still incidental. So you're telling me if, if Banfield had been, suspend, uh, had been concussed and hadn't got to his feet straight away, 
that there'd be nothing to answer. Uh, there certainly would be something to answer, but it's still incidental. It does, it, incidental doesn't matter because it's a result, clearly. If he'd been knocked out, Butters would be getting time. There's no, no. There's no two ways about it. He would get time. Yeah, so, so it's I, I agree with your, over action. I agree with your premise about, I love the attack on the footy. Uh, it is incidental, but we've taught by the AFL that it's... It's about the action, and here it's about the result, which is Banfield gets to his feet, plays on, uh, as opposed to, and I don't know if they're challenging this, but I saw the Charlie Dick, uh, the Charlie Cameron they tackle are, they on Lever, and he had one arm free. He went to ground. I thought he accentuated his head hitting the ground to some degree to, to, to get the free kick. He played on. Oh, I'm glad they're challenging that, Brisbane. So, so there, there's some confusion there, and I'm still confused about the butters one. So that's where I say that there's how we feel about the incident. So I think... You and I are happy for that to happen in footy, but then there's how you feel about how this is being judged in the game right now because for mine, it looks like that sort of incident should be reported. And and if he gets him high and there's a um, uh, the ability to cause injury, I'm using the wrong word there, likelihood of causing injury, which that incident was, mm. then that needs to be reported in the way they're umpiring it. I don't think he sh- should be reported for it, but... The way that we've seen the first five weeks. Has to be. Well, he has to be, and he hasn't been, and there wasn't a free kick. So is that one rule for some, one rule for others? What, what's going on there? Well, you know, I'm not saying there's a, a Zach Butters uh, tax. We know the Toby Green tax generally has given him well, so some Butters extra time. Is the other way. Possible, because he's such a fair play. He's a really good player. He's a Brownlow medal contender, came close last year. We love him. I think he's a brilliant player so, and a completely fair player. So it's not in his um, DNA to be causing that sort of incident intentionally. Maybe that comes into play, not sure. But I, look, I found it really confusing that A, no free kick was given, and B, at least at least like the Charlie Cameron one, he gets sided, and if he, they appeal and get him off, I just wanted to see more than just, no, nah, he's right. Just let me tell you, though, we've just spoken about that for six minutes. You have around about five minutes and 59 seconds less on the footy field to make this decision that Butters does, right? So oh. this is why the... This is why the, the protection of the head is important, and I can see the AFL doing it, but I don't think you're going to stop incidents like this. Zach Butters is always going to attack it like that, and Bailey Manfield's going to put his head over the ball. So whether he's a reporter or not, we're going to see this incident. It's the outcome-based adjudication off the back of it, which is, I think, confusing for players. Like you said, um, Bailey Banfield gets up, you know, plays on. Oh, nothing to answer. So Even if he stays down for 30 seconds... There's, I mean, how he did not get a free kick, maybe the, the controlling umpire was blindsided. Anyway, it, let me just make this very clear. Fremantle did not lose the game this week because of bad umpiring, in my opinion. I think they had to clean up some issues in the last four or five minutes, but again, I don't think umpiring had was the uh, mitigating factor. We'll get into that game in just a little bit. Tom Libertore incident on the weekend was an interesting one, and then the fallout and the, and the messaging from the Bulldogs even stranger. So Tom Libertore... Uh, after some big contests, and, and it's got to be said, there wasn't a real obvious head knock here, but the footage is very clear. Behind the goals, he's standing next to his opponent in Darcy Parrish, Parrish and he collapses. And Darcy Parrish knows he collapses, immediately signals to the bench. He was concerned. And for someone to do that in opposition in the last quarter, he hasn't tripped over his ankles, right? Which is what... Um, there was so many confusing elements to this. So... Why on earth Western Bulldogs would put Tom Liberatore out for media after something like that happening, which they would have known about? He was on radio straight after the game saying, oh, yeah, rolled my ankle and tripped over my ankle. Bullshit. And then Luke Beveridge is out doing the same thing in the, in the press conference. Well, how they got that so wrong when it's cl- he's clearly collapsed, whether it's his whatever it is. I'm not going to make a medical judgment here, but he's collapsed in the middle of the ground. So that, that, that would, for me, is strange. And an opposition player realising it wasn't a case of, oh, he's tripped over himself, he'll get up, has made it clear we need assistance here. The medical staff at the Bulldogs allowed him to stay on there. Now, again, we are far from... Uh, we have far Experts. from <laughs> the expertise to give comment on anything, really, <laughs> let alone uh, medical uh, areas. But that is so bizarre. Uh, the fact that Tom spoke after the game, oh, you know, either way, look, as a media person, we, we hey, what happened? 
That's what we want to find out. So, yeah, but, but if you had knock, I reckon it's one of those ones you can go, Tom, you're not doing media today. They've got 20, 21 other players to do it. Yeah, well, I'm not sure afterwards. I mean, he was spoken to on the ground by, what have been, Abby, was it? Either way, um, I think they go up to the player, and if the player's happy to do it, back in my day when I did a couple of boundary runs, they just say, no, not today, mate. <laughs> this is from a winning team. This is your <laughs> AFL PA going, nah, mate, I don't, can't be can't <laughs> Hang on, <laughs> don't drag me into this. It's my <laughs> AFL PA. I'm not, I'm not Paul Marsh. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, some of the footballs going back. Now they're educated. Mate, you're getting paid a shitload of money mm. by the broadcast. Talk. Yes. And it's still, I reckon it's a work in progress for the AFL. The, I divert attention from the, the liberatory issue. Correct. Because because liberatory is separate. And this is the whole thing with protecting the head. The, the clubs need to be there to save players from themselves. Of course, of course Tom Liberatore is going to come out and say, oh, no, I just tripped over my ankles because he wants to play next week. And but that's... You can't have that. That's literally the entire point of what we're doing here. But my confusion is, just briefly, is that with the Liber case, the game was done. Nothing to be gained in the last five or six minutes. Get him off. Have him assessed. Check the ankle if he says it's the ankle. But it was clear that it was more than... Than, than what Liber said, and yeah, I don't blame him at all for trying to disguise it because you you know you don't want to be off the field. But yeah, and then Luke Beveridge, talk about coaches under pressure. We'll get into that in the Western Bulldogs game, but uh, I think we caught I flagged this a few weeks ago. If the Bulldogs weren't going too well, he might be under the pump, and he is well and truly under the pump with some of his decision making. Will Schofield, Mark Redding, Shelter Footy Cast. Let's get into the footy skater. Let's stay in the West. I reckon we start. Well, you're going to start with the. The, the sad or the happy? What do you we'll want to We'll go start the with? good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay. So we'll start with the positive news. All right, let's go. West Coast defeat Richmond, 109 to 70. Uh, first win since the Western Bulldogs late last year for, for the West Coast Eagles. I think they beat North Melbourne after that. Uh, their last win was July 30, 2023 at home. Right. And that was uh, against North by five points. And just to steal some of your stats, first time they kicked it. more than 100 points since round two against the Giants last year. Uh, and as I mentioned, since 2021, July. First time the Eagles uh, AFL and Waffle team have won on the same day. So lots of good numbers coming up for the Eagles against albeit an undermanned and uh, let's say a, a, a Richmond side that were missing plenty of talent. So uh, in an AFL game, usually the average of goals from stoppage is nine. There was ten. There was eleven stoppage goals uh, in the in the first half. It was just an absolute bloodbath from stoppage. And Richmond didn't have the cattle in there. It's got to be said. And I'm not trying to talk down the wind, but. They're missing a significant amount of players and certainly through the midfield. They had no options. They didn't put Dusty in there really at, at all. He can't be fit. Tells me he's not fit. Uh, he's either injured. Um, he, he's the guy you put in there to go head-to-head head with a Tim Kelly and Elliot Yo, Harley Reid. But on the positive side of things, there was many. The stoppages was elite. Tim Kelly was prolific in there. Uh, prolific, even. Uh, Elliot Yo, Enormous. Um he is well and truly back to his very, very best. That is what Elliot Yo looks like. Bursting out of packs, kicking goals, big tackles. Or he had everything in that game. And then, like I said last week, when the, when the senior players play well, it allows Harley Reid, Ruben Jimby, Noah Long to, to almost play a role. Now, Harley Reid has 27 disposal and kick, kick a goal, which is you know, a bit beyond role-playing. And surely he has the NAB rising star this week. But it just allows him to fall in. You know, Elliot Yo is best on the ground. But Harley Reid doesn't have to be. Yeah, and I said that this morning, Ray, Elliot Yo best on ground. Bear in mind, you've got a guy kicking six goals in Jake Waterman. that has to be pretty close to... <laughs> pretty point. close to... Very good and, uh, now, I, I fell into the same job because I saw so much of Yo that I loved that I sort of forgot that, you know, Jake yeah. did kick a career high, six goals and... and 13 marks and nine contested. And so much up and down the ground stuff that uh, Jakey was just terrific. He had a huge preseason. We know the illness that he's been uh, through in the past, but he has to go close to... B.O.G. Yeah, correct. I, what I really like about Jake is for a long time he hasn't been the guy, right? He's had Kennedy and then it went to Allen last year and Jack Darling probably in the middle there. But there, there is roles within forward lines that you play when you are the guy. It doesn't mean you pay the most money or anything like that, but um, the way a forward line structures up, there's one person that's more than likely to get the ball and then the others sort of come in around him. So he's playing that role now. It allows Jack Darling to sort of play second fiddle, which I think is a good thing. I don't think you want Jack as your number one guy. No. And then, you know, you feed an Oscar now, Allen back into this forward line and it starts to look pretty good. Now, they've put two performances together that have been consistent, right? Sydney, can, you know, don't win, but consistent effort. Uh, this one against Richmond, consistent. They need to go three in a row against Freo next week. And so if we see this type of performance, by and large, for the rest of the season, they're winning a handful of games. Yeah, that, well, that's, 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 that's a, a given. Given... 
you're going to have either a team that's off their game, a team that's injured and banged up like like Richmond, yes. and particularly at home. I think they're an opportunity to, to get some results. And they've got some cattle coming back. Liam Ryan, by the way, just a bit of a side note, he played half back for the Eagles and the Waffle. Now, you know Liam so much better than I. This seems like a really um, left field potential move by the Eagles uh, when he returns to the side. Is there, do you think there's a possibility he might, or was this, was, was this just to get him back into the flow of footy and, and, and help him uh, return with a, you know, the ball coming to him? What's, what's the theory? I can. I'll hopefully reveal a little bit more. So I knew last week, and you won't like this, but I did hold my cards a little close to my chest. I knew he was playing back line. I saw him on Wednesday, and uh, and he came up to me. He goes, brass, 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 whispering pretty much. He's like, brass, I'm playing in the back line this, this week. And I was like, you're in the back line. I said, you want me to teach you how to spoil big fella? He goes, no, nah, don't worry about that, brass. I'll, I'll just, just take, take hangers. Speckies. Just take speckies over everyone. But... Look, I think there's a real possibility they want to use him in that that half back role, the ball user. I mean, you think about how he plays; he's a great kick. Was that someone like Jets who oh, yep. you know, was, yep. was terrific in that role? Yeah, and th- and they're probably missing that ball user. You know, they've got Duggan back there, but I think they'd probably like to get him a bit higher up the ground than than he's been. He trained all preseason as a midfield uh, in the midfield, Liam Duggan, but he's gone back because of injuries and necessity. So I think they, they're they really entertaining playing Liam Ryan as a backman. I think he has the attributes. He, he's athletic. He's competitive. He's a good kick. So What's his engine like? Uh, elite. If there's a football out there, elite, right? If really? it's pre-season and it's running, uh, don't even worry about it. He'll be, he'll be doing his shoelaces up for most of the running session. But if you put a football in front of him and he's got something to win, got someone to beat, probably, probably top five at the club. He's one of those players that he would he would be last in the time trial, yeah. like close to it anyway. If you're going to go run laps around the oval, but if you put a football out in front, he'd probably be the number one. Can I ask you a slightly offbeat question yeah. about Liam? Doesn't wear a mouth guard, correct? Don't know. Probably. Well, well, I, no, well no idea. pretty hard because I see him chewing gum when he's when he's playing. Yeah, probably can't. It'd be hard to do that with a mouth guard. Yeah, I just I find it weird that in such a confrontational sport that I know there's some that don't, but. Yeah, he just wanders around, chews gum, and doesn't wear a mouth guard. That's uh, at stages I, in my career, I didn't didn't wear one. Yeah, just uncomfortable. Yeah, for me, for me personally, it was talking. Like I was a big talker on the field. I don't mean like you and me having a chat. I was a big directional. Yeah, I was a big directional guy. And at times, I I think my mouth guard didn't fit properly, and it was almost like I was spitting words out of a, out of a I don't know gummy bear in front of my teeth. So. Um, yeah, I didn't wear it in stages, but I wore it for the back end of my career. So not that strange. I, th- I would say there'd be more players than you'd think not wearing them, probably. Okay. Well, good luck to him. Hopefully he doesn't cop one of them. Correct. Sure. So we'll see what happens there. It'd be good to see if he can get back in the side, but certainly positive signs from West Coast. Yeah, 47,000 there. and It was just, just nice to be at the ground where they were competitive and Eagles fans, uh, they haven't had much to sing about. And it just sets it up nicely for the Derby this week. Gives us a bit more flavour, a bit more spice and, and hopefully a competitive game because by and large, they've been fairly, like, very one-sided last year. Uh, the Dockers um, have owned them recently. Uh, Harley Reid's well-liked, isn't he? Uh, liked? No, no, no. no he's, he's adored no, already. Not by the fans. I mean by his, by his teammates. Oh, yeah. So yeah. he kicked a goal. He did a couple other things and... and like everyone's getting to him. He's already kicked his first goal. That doesn't happen. Uh, He's kicked his first goal. And this would be a great trivia question moving forward. Where did Harley Reid kick his first goal? Of course, yes. it was in Mount Barker in the Adelaide Hills, which yeah, not bad. off his left foot, his first goal in WA, off his right foot. He's a right footer. So uh, that is very good. But look, I just think... From what I saw, he's clearly well-liked by his teammates. You don't always get that with these sorts of players. Sometimes you don't you know, get along with everyone, but everyone seems to love Harley. Cool so. kid. Absolutely. We knew it was going to be a win, uh, big win when Ben Cousins and Harley Reid were lying on a bed together during the week. The <laughs> <laughs> now, let's get back to the uh, footy skeet up. Fremantle, Port Adelaide to another look uh, in in the dying minutes lost to the Frio Dockers. Port Adelaide 65, defeat Frio 63. I was watching this game. I was yelling at my TV. I really wanted Frio to win this one. But for some reason, and it was probably because of the last week before, it was just going to happen. I, I could, yeah. No matter what was going on, they were going to lose that game. And and that, that not saying anything about the players or coaches or anything. It was just like the momentum of the game just told me that Port were going to have a chance. They were going to take it, and then Freo weren't. But that's has to be. That's got to be at the feet of the Dockers. I know there's some really nice individual performances, but as a Rosie winning the clearance on Francis. Charlie Dixon, who was absolutely toweled up by his own admission by yes. Alex Pierce, 
who was enormous. I think they're, they're best close to it on the, on the night. Again. Yeah. Uh, but you're 100% right. You could feel that with five minutes to go, that something would happen to facilitate uh, Port getting into the game. I just, you know, do they look back and you can say, look, we, we were very good for a long time, but the last two weeks, albeit different circumstances, one was initially, you know, trying to, trying to save the game against Carlton. Yep. This one, you get behind and then you try to win the game. So essentially in the last five minutes, the same picture evolved for them. And they couldn't get it done. Why is that? Why is it? Is it, is it coaching? Is it playing? Is it structure? Well, what is it? Sometimes it's just footy. But I think those these games, these two games, they will learn so much from. There'll be so many moments that when you lose a game by under a goal, you, as a player, you think about moments. You think, oh, what about that contest or that kick or that opportunity that you missed? Whereas you lose by 100, which West Coast have been doing, you don't mm. learn a lot. You, you, you think, oh, you know, <laughs> 10 contests I lost – but but this specifically, things get embedded into you. So I know Caleb Sarong wouldn't have slept well. He had an opportunity to win on his left foot with a, with under a minute to go. He will think about that. How could I possibly finish that goal and and really turn myself from elite mid into one of the best? You know, because the very best finished that goal. He, he had an AO open shot there, and, and I'm being harsh, opposite foot, but he the very best kicked those. Likewise, Bailey Banfield, again, a couple of tough opportunities. One in the right pocket, on the full. went across the face, one in the left pocket. Yeah, so, yeah, and I'm, I have no doubt I'd do the same. If, if you're the player that misses that and you look back, you get beaten by a kick, you take it upon yourself, say, I cost my team the game, which yep. isn't the case, but it certainly would play on your mind. Yeah, which I, I think is a good situation to be in. Clearly, winning and being five and nothing is great, but at least they're in them, at least they're learning. Alex Pierce, like he's close to best on ground. Charlie Dixon takes a mark to to kick a goal with five minutes to go. So you can be as good as Alex Pierce was all day, but then one contest, you you get it wrong and he marks it and then it's game over. So that's how finite, you know, that's sorry, that's how fine these margins are in the AFL. I think Port Adelaide's a really good side. I think they're a top four side. So Frio and so are Carlton. So Frio lose in games they could have won. I don't like saying should have won because they didn't. So bad luck. That's how footy goes. But they certainly could have if they get their structures right in the Carlton game. If they probably, I think it's probably more opportunity in the um, Freo in the Port Adelaide game. They could have won, but they didn't. So they shouldn't have won. Josh Tracy, I thought was outstanding. His best game at AFL level: three goals, nine marks, but up and down and a real, you know, power, powerful, powerful forward. I've been, I've been banging on about him, the big Kahuna, for a long time. I love him, and they just need to keep playing him, and he's going to do that more and more. And it. He's going to be a very, very good player. Yeah, first time for the season, he really took the marks at you know, 50-50 against Carlton. He dropped a couple and he wasn't quite clunking them, but I thought, you're right, early on he took a, a strong mark and it set the theme for his. And I had a really a purple patch in that second quarter, I think it was, kicked the, the three goals and yep. you know, had a, a bit go his way, but he finished beautifully. Uh, yeah, he came up the ground as well to give the, the defenders a, a target to kick to, so uh, absolutely outstanding from him. Conversely, I guess, Matt Taberner's future in the side has to be brought into question. Well, he'll be out next With week. Darcy coming back no, and Jackson out. pushing forward. Um, Michael Walters was disappointing, it has to be said. Look, he was really good for the first couple of weeks, kicked two, four, I think, against the Crows. He's what? playing a role now. He's though, playing Scanner. a role. He's not. He's not expected to kick five goals no, every but, week. But he's expected to hit the scoreboard as a small forward. But yeah. and he's and he's he'll play in the derby. But there will be um, will be some pressure from the likes of maybe Cooper Simpson, small forwards. Witkowski's obviously in there as well. Banfield. Um, but I think you know Michael Walters not under the gun, but certainly far short of his best. By and large, they did a lot right. I think they did probably eighty percent of the game, like they did against Carlton. There's so many similarities. Uh, but they find themselves, instead of an unblemished record, they come home with uh, with some work to do. But I, I, look, if I, see, I, I wasn't that impressed by Carlton against Fremantle and Port Adelaide, a very beatable. Yeah, I, but, I think. But 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 both those sides play the way they did because of Frio's pressure. I know. I'm, it's, I'm giving credit to Fremantle. I didn't didn't think Fremantle looked anything other than extremely competitive against yeah. those two sides. Um, the two I'd sort of not having the gun, but just questioning. You know, Erasmus is. Been sub a couple of no, weeks, didn't time. play. Yeah, he hasn't played a game in four four weeks. So if he doesn't play, so he doesn't come into the team and play, he has to play in the waffle for a few weeks just to get him playing. You can't improve as a player if you're sub and sub. Bailey Banfield was that last year, but he's a senior player. Neil Erasmus, they need to develop. And Matty Johnson, you know, those two... Matty Johnson fumbles too much for mine, and I think they could have a look at a Will Brody. Um, I know we've sort of wondered where he's gone. I think they could add someone like that to the mix. If we see 
you know, a Hayden Young um, and maybe some more defensive side from a Brayshaw, they might be able to get a Will Brody in. The big reason he hasn't come in is is the defensive elements, and they've been concerned about that with with Fife, Young, Sarong, Brayshaw, and then a Brody. And so, you know, maybe Matty Johnson's good defensively, but for mine, he hasn't had the impact that they need from those sorts of players. Difficult, difficult. But I think they could have a look at selection-wise across the board there. And, of course, as you mentioned, Luke Jackson and Sean Darcy debate. Yeah, and I think Heath Chapman's not far away from coming back into the mix as well from a, an injury perspective. I do think that Erasmus was best to feel when he played for Peel in the season open against East Fremantle. Um, I'm not sure what his contract situation is. I'm not saying he's, he'd be impatient, but you'd be just uh, having a look around if this continues for the rest of the season as to what your options are, because I'm sure there'd be clubs willing to have a look at him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that absolutely they would. He's a good player. Um, best on in a waffle game, he'd be probably playing in, in a lot of other teams. So that's probably good for Freeman. I will finish on this. Luke Jackson, Sean Darcy, which we'll speak about on Thursday. Do you want, for our fans, do you want Luke Jackson to win a Brownlow? Or do you want to win a flag? Because I think if he stays in the ruck and the debate's going to come up on Thursday when Sean Darcy comes into the team, if you want him to win a Brownlow, keep him in the ruck and Sean Darcy can go and ruck down appeal and you can have a Brownlow medalist. Or if you want to win a flag, you'll play Sean Darcy. You'll have Luke Jackson as a high forward, rotating through the midfield like he did for Melbourne with Max Gorn right, for a premiership. That's the decision that needs to be made and I'll, I won't hear any other comments about that. Scene. Well, and I don't think there's any discussion anyway because I don't think Luke Jackson's winning a, a Brownlow medal as a ruckman uh, in right. the short term. I think he got towed up. Um, Soldo had 60 hit outs. Absolutely. So that's an that issue. doesn't happen against Darcy. But you're right. Darcy comes in automatically when he's right and the Dockers are better for it. Let's get to the other game. Skeet up. Brisbane defeat Melbourne. I bloody picked it. I told you, though. You it, it was a must-win game. Melbourne, nothing on the line. Brisbane just absolutely sizzling. You could tell from the first two seconds of the game that Brisbane going to win this one. 82-60. Yeah. to 60. They get it done. Uh, probably a bit closer than it needed to be. Just the 60 points for Melbourne. I don't know if there's any issues there. But certainly, there were some big players in this one. Cam Rayner was significant. Uh, 25 disposals and a shitload of clearances. Uh, everyone had big games that needed to for Brisbane. And you could just see... They, they needed to win this game. Otherwise, you know, like the season starts getting called into question if they're starting one and four or what they would have been. No question. And look, you, you pointed out last Thursday that that was the, that was the, the issue for, for Brisbane that they had started so slowly. So they had to, had to find a way. Melbourne had come off a big week in Adelaide. So they were feeling pretty good about life. Yes. So you're right. They, and you read it early and you called it correctly that they found uh, the energy. In the first five minutes, you knew that the pressure and Melbourne weren't switched on in any way, shape or form. We know that, um, well, interesting. Clayton Oliver did play. But found himself, yeah, I don't think he's... Well, it was, it was under doubt with an injury, wasn't he? Finger, yeah, it, finger. He was playing in the back line in the last quarter. But really was, weird. That's what he matched up against one of the small Brisbane forwards. Absolutely no idea what he was doing back there. Max Gorn had 51 hit outs, but was ineffective. And so they had the 51, but Brisbane wins stoppage and clearance. So, um, you know, that's that's a part of the game that they'll need to continue to working on because they have a dominant midfield. But um, teams know that Max Gorn's going to win those hit outs, so they just start matching up on you know Melbourne midfielders and winning the clearance battle. Uh, Charlie Cameron kicked three goals in this one. They are challenging um, his one-week suspension, which I think they should. Yep. Lever had an arm free. We need to have ability to take players to ground. He wasn't hurt. He played on. And so yeah, I, I'm very strong on that. I mean, yeah, and you've been out there, I haven't. But surely when you're tackling a player, and again, I didn't feel there was a... Jake looked like he might have lent into it a bit you know, for I mine, thought, or just I, how I looked at it. No, I agree. I thought, it, I thought he might even slightly accentuated the, yep. the the fact that his head made some sort of impact with the ground. I'd be staggered if he... I'd be surprised if he doesn't get off here, Charlie. Just the 60 points to Melbourne, and they haven't been high scoring this year, and they've been winning and they've been impressive, but they, they haven't been a high octane offence. Do they have the cattle to kick goals? If Fritch, Fritch kicks two goals, if he doesn't kick a bag... You know, who are they, who's up there? Chandler, Van Royen, Ben Brown, who, who doesn't look at his best. They never have had a power sort of forward line. That, the one you sort of think, wow, who's going who's gonna to take you to the cleaners this yeah, way? They just don't have that, that type of forward line. Never have, really. It's a good point. I, I just think it's uh, something that if you're looking for a weakness in Melbourne, that's what it is. Exactly. It's their firepower. Because they're going to get midfield dominance Defense and supply. Defence is very good. So their forward line is that weakness that some sides don't have. There's a few teams that don't have those sorts of weaknesses, and I think Melbourne does. Now, um, uh, uh, Petty, 
v Noah Answorth. What did you think of this one? Yeah, with, look, this uh, goes back to a couple of years ago at the Gabba where yeah. there was um, there was some taunting of sorts towards. I mean, Zorko was involved in all this, and there was some stuff said to him. Apparently, Petty um, was mocked up there for yeah. for shedding some tears on the ground. Now. I, I stand corrected. Was it related to family, the family issue thing. with his mum? Yeah, something like and that. And I'm treading carefully here. But then for, for Answorth to come out and do what he did after Petty kicked a goal. Now, you got to. I, I, the thing is, Petty apparently is pretty, pretty yep. good on the lips. So yep. yeah, we I, don't know what happened out there, but from what if you're just watching it, it looked like a nervous Noah Answorth against a bigger opponent in the moment. Obviously. I reckon Petty said something to him and then Answorth's like, well, I can't fight him. You could just sort of see me sort of pushed at him and then I was like, oh, shit, what do I do? I'll give him the, the, the tears. So it's obviously something that they talk about in the locker room, I think. You don't just do that. He hasn't saved that up from two and a half years ago. Has no he been? Answorth. Has any penalty been... I read someone on on, so, on Twitter or an ex, a $10,000 fine. No, I now, think, I, I think, think that would have been, been a, a parody account, which I'm <laughs> at least I've got that much in my bank account to know that there's uh, there's some piss-taking going if, on. If anyone does have any spare time, I would pay a significant amount of money to see a Mark Reddings parody <laughs> account on Twitter. Oh, don't do that. I'll just say Just saying, <laughs> I reckon that could be quite enjoyable to look through. Uh, a good win by Melbourne. Let's keep moving. Essendon, defeat Bulldogs, oh. 96-67. I mean, fair dinkum. Did we... At some point, people have been hitting me up over the weekend. Was this some? Was this something that we said we're doing naked laps for? What was the naked laps? I, said, I think it's might have been if um, Luke Edwards played, which he did, by the way. He did. Essendon smashed, Ryan did well. smashed the Bulldogs. Smashed them. What is going on here? I mean, credit where credit's due. Essendon come out. They, they look, um, you know, they look switched on and connected and. The defensive side looks good. Uh, Zach Merritt, very good. 27 disposals. You know, Bombers kicked five goals in the last. Absolutely wiped the Bulldogs. Bulldogs just completely gone. But I want to focus on the Bulldogs here. They they uh, dropped Caleb Daniel. They've dropped Jack McRae, who's back in the side. They've got Bailey Dale starting as a sub. For mine, which I've spoken about a lot at West Coast, that is not selection integrity and it's not clarity. Players will just, I, I can guarantee you, Players are going, what the fuck's going on here? What, 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 what are we doing? Are we a good side? Are we poor side? Beveridge's comments after the game, he was kind of insinuating that they're not actually that good. This list is very good. Jamar Eugle Hagen and Norton as forwards. Big ticks, right? Uh, Bontem Pally, probably the best player in the game or second to Rose, probably. I don't know. Tim English is an All-Australian ruckman. You've got Caleb Daniel who's won All-Australians. You've got Bailey Dale who you're not playing All-Australian. What what's Liam Jones is a good keep back. What's the issue here? What is it beverage? Is it uh is it inner workings at the football club? Because they're clearly they're not getting it done. But this is a long term and not just this season. This happened last year as well. And the year before, There's yeah. some connectivity missing. And I know you're a massive fan of Aaron Norton. Now whether the ball's not coming to him correctly or he's just out of touch at the moment or what the case is, but the strong calls continue for him to go back. I know that's not something you are advocating, but there, there needs a, a change, a reset by the footy club because I think you've summed up in, in a lot of areas they've, where they've, they, they've chopped and changed and they look like a team. And Essendon, let me just give them some credit. They copped a, a whack in the media last week. Yep. Neither of us have high ratings next to the Bombers' name, but they they, they made the, the Bulldogs look, Second rate in the second, or particularly during the third quarter. Skeeter, Bulldogs have won the inside 50 count. They have the same amount of marks inside 50, 15 each, and they've lost by six goals. So is that heart? Is that desire? Is that yes. structure? All of the above, I would have thought. Wow. I mean, I mean, they hadn't, I think it's been one of the past 10 against the Bulldogs. So a really good performance for Essendon. I don't want to downplay what they did. Bombers, terrific. But you're right, the biggest question, the biggest question mark as a football club at the moment is against the Bulldogs. Riley Sanders was subbed off as well. And he's pissed off. Been, well, I, I think probably as he should be. There's a couple of players there doing absolutely stuff all. You've got your number one draft pick, you know, high draft pick that you've pumped up all pre-season and then you get him off and subbed out of the game for the second time this year. I don't know if that's teaching him the right thing. I don't... I, yeah, I, I would say as a player from external... There'll be a lot of players going, oh, what the fuck is going on? I thought we were meant to be good. Uh, our coaches in the media are saying, we're not that good. We've got Tom Liberatore out there, uh, concussed. We've got, <laughs> like Tom Liberatore, I didn't mention him. He's an absolute star in the midfield. Like, they've got Trelaw. Like, their list, is, their list is top four. You can't tell me they're not. 
You can't tell them anyway. But just quickly, in the last quarter, when the game was there to be won, the big names didn't get hold of it. They didn't, didn't touch it. And Jake Stringer, uh, you know, he turned it on and against his old club, absolutely loved it. So, no, you're right. There was a big review at the Bulldogs, but there'll be an even bigger review at the end of the season if they continue in this path. They started Bont and Pally at full forward for the first centre bounce. Why the fuck would you do that? It doesn't make any sense. That to me is like, oh, we're going to change some things up. We're going to flip the magnets. How about you get your best player in the centre bounce for the first bounce and get some momentum on the scoreboard? I would have thought that would probably be the best idea. Yeah. Best clearance players in the game. Get him in the midfield. I don't know. Has he been too funky, Bevo? Oh, I think he might be, mate. 17 touches for Bontempelli, by the way. So he was quiet. Um, you know, Liberatore and McRae have 25. But, They'll um, probably win this week against yeah. the Saints. And, yeah, correct. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you watch. You absolutely watch. You watch. We're picking them as well, I reckon. Uh, all right, let's get into some tight games. There were some good ones uh, later in the weekend. GWS defeats St Kilda, 80 to 79. This was great. I was watching this as I was calling another game, and to be honest, I was uh, paying more attention to this oh, one. Oh, you had a good one. You had a good game in the end as well. Uh, correct, but this one was a great finish. Uh, GWS just limp over the line. I was thinking last week about GWS. I think they're clearly well, quite clear, quite close to clearly. Uh, the number one side in the comp. What's going to stop them? Um, they look connected. They look like the game plan's there. They've got the good players. And I thought some big injuries to some big players might be the one. Well, this one, look, honestly, it, it, it's probably a good result on Monday. But when it was all happening, I th- Sam, Sam Taylor looked, mate, look, I don't want to say it. He looked in real trouble. It, yeah, yeah, no good. They had ambulance like paramedics out there eight minute stoppage for a game which is that's since there's something significant um it's a it's a decent injury when you've got your one medical team out there when you have the opposition medical team there that's bad and then when the ambulance officers that are there at the ground are out there too that's really bad i think he was seizuring on the ground it looked horrific it looked like he got knocked out um from the player that really incidental and then he was unconscious and then his head hit the ground unconscious. So terrible for him. And then Stephen Cornelio, I thought when I saw this injury, done, see you later, 12 months. His knee went at right angles while his body went the other direction. Knee one way, body the other. I thought he'd snapped every ligament in his... They reckon he's back in two weeks. Yeah. No, he's under Ryan Merrick. I thought Ryan Merrick was going off to the cemetery last <laughs> week. And he's, he's played this <laughs> this week. Uh, but you're right. So that's actually a really good result for the Giants. Bear in mind, you know, if it's Cornelia, t- say a month, if he's out for a month. That's yep. a terrific result. And Sam Taylor, he might well be two or three weeks. given Pro- Needs to be. Protocols needs and also to be. The, the significance of that concussion. Um, had this game done, dusted. The, the, the yep. Giants three-quarter time. Credit to St Kilda. Found a way to come back. Ron Marshall... I thought was – and look, he's got to be in the top two or three ruckman in the competition as we speak. He's yeah. a very good young player. Absolutely. And, uh, merging in, ended up with 28 disposals, 16 clearances, 25 hit-outs. Brad Hill, he, when he's playing well, yep. St Kilda does as well. Yeah, they feed him as well, don't they? And I spoke to Sperry about this on the weekend. They used to do it with Stephen Hill at, at Freo, and Brad's just similar. When, when they start feeding him, you see he has 33 touches, kicks one goal, one goal two, 13 marks. That's their that's their game, right? You got uh, Wangan and Malira, uh, you got Jack uh, Sinclair, um, you know those sorts of guys getting the ball in their hands, and they start doing what they did in the last quarter and just coming, and you can't stop it. I think it was Peatling the uh, the sub that came on and a huge mark late. He came on for Sam Taylor. That was good to see. Uh, Max King, that they I read a report yesterday that they were thinking it could have been an ACL, which it's not. But it could have been a game where we've lost three superstars from the game. Sam Taylor, Stephen King, or Max King. And if Max King had a, you know, done for the year, that's almost St Kilda done and dusted. But apparently, good to go this week. So uh, it was a cracking game. And St Kilda just don't get it done. And GWS will be thinking, well, you know, thank God we've won that one. Yeah, and it was uh, injuries played a part. But also St Kilda, the way they came back. The Giants, though, uh, on top of the table. Uh, but yeah, they were a bit shaky at times in that last quarter for sure. All right, let's move on. Skeeter, Adelaide defeat Carlton. This was an absolute ripper. Oh, this was my sort of upset. I said to you last Thursday, and you sort of, you went, you just, you know, you got that, that loud, throaty laugh that you come at me with when you think I'm being an absolute tool. <laughs> <laughs> you like that? Yeah. Well, that's what you gave me when I said Adelaide, I think, can really cause the Blues some issues. What well, did, did you pick them? I did on this show, I think, yes. Did I, 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 tell you what, I did you know what I did more importantly? I backed them at the line, which is plus twenty. <laughs> so you can stick it up your jumper. I got the coin, as I did with as I did with the another game during the week, which is Fremantle versus I can tell you now, I was very bubbly about I just didn't think Carlton, I thought they escaped the previous week. Right. And they obviously led for a large portion of Saturday's game. But I, I thought they were 
they're just going at the moment without, you know, winning games of footy. But Adelaide, a bit like you mentioned with the Brisbane Lions, they had they to win. They just had to get a, get a result somehow, and they, and they did. How'd you go on the punt this weekend? Uh, if you had them in the line, you must have well, gone right. Very poorly against uh, Brisbane, Melbourne, and then I worked my way back to. As you I listen to me, I, picked, I told you about Brisbane. Yeah, well, I, said, I lost money early in the weekend, but then. As I say to my wife, ended up breaking even, which is always important. <laughs> oh, Victoria always come into this, mate. You're, you're, this is your own control. Victoria has nothing to do with you. She, she doesn't control anything in my life <laughs> outside of the house. <laughs> well, that's partially a lie as well. Can we clip that up and turn it to Victoria and see how that goes for skate this evening? Uh, Adelaide, oh, look, I thought I was really impressed. Um, they, they changed the way they've been playing. Um, at stages, they were patient with ball movement. They looked to switch a lot on Carlton and then... When they could, they went and they got it into their dangerous forwards. Taylor, Ticks. yep, Taylor Walker was very good. Uh, Fogarty, honestly, it was quiet, really quiet. But he had some moments in the last quarter that was very good. Uh, ben Keys looked dangerous. We, we knew him as a midfielder probably a couple of years ago, Ben Keys, but he is a permanent forward now. But the really big different mate, difference makers, and people have been calling for this, is Rankin and Rochelle. Yep, Rochelle was the leading possession getter on the ground uh, for Adelaide at half time. He was. Uh, winning clearances and then Rankin was getting on the end of it and the last quarter from Rankin was outstanding and he is a difference maker for them like he is a guy that is uh, different to uh, Laird and Dawson and Berry and Crouch you know all these guys he, he's something very different and he, he was outstanding yeah absolutely and Jake Saligo I love that name Saligo That's he was it, good he was terrific um a career high, fifteen contested possessions, six clearances. So a young player. Yep. Look, he's he's still got a bit of work to do on his game. But this, you mentioned some of those young players. Adelaide's got the core group there, and Sam Berry, for what it's worth, came onto the ground, kicks the match winner. Yep. Uh, you know, finally from an Adelaide perspective, we're seeing something. They've got the Bombers at home this week, but that was a, a huge win against the Carlton side that has been so renowned at winning close matches, but they butchered some footy late in the piece there. I think, oh, he's missed a, a low ball towards goal. Charlie Kerner had a chance late to take a, a match-winning mark. So Carlton had their opportunities, but oh, I'm pretty happy for, for Manny Nicks because big uh, win. it's a big win away from home. And they've struggled away from home in the past 12 to 18 months. I was impressed with Adelaide's back line just as a little drive-by. I thought Michelani was very good and he's a young player and he's got something. Worrell was good as an interceptor and then they had the young Irishman, uh, Mark Keane, uh, he played on, you know, you got to stop Kerno and Mackay. And so, what did they both kick in the end? Uh, Kerno kicked four goals, three. So, I mean, he didn't keep him that quiet, but two goals to Mackay. Kerno can kick four goals and not have a big impact. Does that make sense? Like, he has the 13 disposals. There's a difference between him having kicking four goals and having 20 plus disposals and, and, and 10 marks. Has the five mark. I just thought they kept them under wraps. They're going to kick goals. You know, you know Mackay and Kerno are kicking goals, right? As a defence, if you can just keep their influence lower, let them kick the goals they're meant to kick. You know, midfielders bursting out of the pack with no pressure. You get, you can't do anything about that. But the big pack marks or the, or the, the freakish goals, if you can limit them, I think you go a long way to beating them. And I was impressed, Skeeter. Sam Walsh returned, by the way, 34 disposals. Yeah, terrific. But uh, as you said, six goals to the big boys. So uh, if they win, Carlton, you know, Adelaide goes, well, they got a couple too many. But when you win by two points, you're right. You've done the job. And, and, and off the back of that, you mentioned Sam Walsh returning, but the Blues also with some injuries oh, yeah. coming out of the game, including Chera prior to, but... Saad. During the match, Saad as well. Um, I think it was one or two others that... Uh, oh, Mitch McGovern did his... I McGovern. Mean. So there you go. So they've got huge game against the Giants this week. Both teams are going to be under man. Yeah, they are. I'll be taking the Giants there. That's some big losses there. Saad, McGovern in their back line. Um, for what it's worth, Zach Williams is pretty good for Kelton as well. Let's keep moving, Skeeter. Gold Coast defeat... Hawthorne. Now, this is a bloodbath. I don't know if this was going any other way, to be honest, Skeeter. Wow. Gold Coast on the Gold Coast against a young Hawthorne side that has no confidence, and they are playing poorly. And Sam Mitchell was very strong in the media after this about how disappointing and unacceptable their performance is. We're here in the bring the mouth guards sort of rule. And I, and I, so I was watching along with this, and we'll go back to going over the game in a second, but just post-match, and you see Sam Mitchell come out and do that. As, a, as you've heard from me a lot, Skeeter, I rate him as a coach. And I thought to myself, I wonder who they're playing next week because he wouldn't be doing this if they're coming up against a Port Adelaide or, you know, Collingwood or because, you know, you roll the boys up and you say, bring the mouth guards. You want a response? You know who they're playing next week, Skeeter? North Melbourne. So he, he knows that bring your mouth guards, you know, rock up ready to try all this bullshit. 
But he wants to say, if you come and work hard at training and you be physical at training, you get the win. So they have to win against North Melbourne. Otherwise, he'll lose credibility within the playing group. But I just thought, I thought, well done to me. Because I was like, there's a reason he's doing this. Because, yeah, that's right, Skeeter, absolutely. <laughs> well done to me. Yeah, well done to me. Because I thought, you know what? <laughs> he's not out here just abusing his players for no reason. And that's why. Because he knows they're going to win next weekend against North Melbourne. Very good. I think that's a good contrast for you and I. Your self-confidence, self-belief just is through the roof week in and week out. Oh, I sometimes lack a bit of that, so I'm trying to just draw some of that. I've got plenty to go around. You've got a, lot, a lot of love to go around, not normally for yourself, but um, <laughs> I give some my way because not everyone's got the same confidence levels okay. as W. No, you've got okay, Skeeter. Uh, what about the Hawks good. today? Actually, yeah, well, I'm going to work. I've got three jobs. I've got to keep moving, <laughs> uh, including wrapping this shit up. Uh, the Hawks, by the way, they were, they were putrid. Oh, this is a very good show, uh, thanks to Shelter. Uh, the, Suns, the Suns plus 96 disposals, plus three uncontested possessions and plus 17 tackles. Will Graham laid 14 tackles for the game. He's just a kid. Yeah. And they worked them out of the game, the Gold Coast. Suns, look, they are always tough to beat up there. But Hawthorne, you're right. Yeah, but, mate, they've got midfielders. They've got... Uh, Jai Newcomb has been a shell of what mm. he was. He had, 10, he had 10 disposals in the midfield. They had... Uh, Warple had 14. Like, this is their on-ballers. Connor Nash, I'll tell you what, like, Connor Nash had 10 disposals. That's their mid. That's their starting midfield. Just didn't get it, did that, they? Uh, mate, Connor Nash needs to have a spell in the VFL, unfortunately. Um, and I don't like calling too many players out, but he is not in form and he doesn't even look like it. Get him out of there. Uh, last year, the Hawks, 7-16, and 16, their record. They've got some work to do to equal what they did in 2023. It's, you're right. Um, you tipped them against Geelong, I remember, a couple of weeks ago. With, and... and who, Rightf- who rightfully so about yeah. what you thought this team could do. They have been banged up, but... Uh, Hawthorne's been pushed to the SM basket for me, Skate. I can't pick them until they're any good. Well, you'll be tipping them Thursday, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just talk... You talk them up because of what you just said, then you've just... You've, uh, I'm a walking contradiction, Skate. Yeah. You know. Right. But you're, you're very happy with yourself. Everything in moderation. Geelong, 139, defeat North Melbourne, 64. I don't know how long we need to spend on this one. Tom Jeremy Walkins Cameron. laid out. Jeremy Cameron dominates. Right? He does. Um, Six uh, goals. I'm going to just put a little poignant note into this because uh, North Melbourne players wore black armbands oh. after the, the tragedy in Sydney. And, um, you know, we're all still looking at what's happened over there with, uh, with heavy hearts. Um, Kerry Good was a former North Melbourne player. And uh, Ash Good, the daughter of uh, of Kerry, sadly passed away. The story is quite well known with um, her giving the her bub to to a, a passerby, and players wore black armbands on that uh, as a mark of respect. So a bit of a sombre note surrounding the game. Mm. Um, North Melbourne at class, no real surprise there, and Geelong uh, ticking along pretty well uh, at GMHBA. Never really a threat, was it? couple of highlights for North. Cheezel looks great, 38, one goal. Um, a couple of young players going okay, but not really much else for there. And Geelong were in second gear, just floating through the game. So there you go. Will Schofield, Mark Reddings, a shell of footy cast. Skeeter, uh, we've got some uh, listener yeah. questions coming and The way in. you say it with a smiley face, I just feel there's like a couple of clips coming from me. Well, because I never read these until I get to them because I like to be surprised as well. I just see the first I sentence. I can tell you've read them for the first time as well. Is that right? Yeah. Well, oh, okay. No, oh, sorry, like, oh, oh no, sorry. No, no, no. Because I, I know what you're feeling. I can say this because if I'm doing 6PR breakfast sometimes we're doing and you look at the text line, you start reading it yes. and you get to a stage where you think, hang on, I should be you talking. Drop, drop the F-bomb or drop this and, and you think, oh, I've got to stop here because it's going to end me... Uh, with a uh, a legal suit. Hey, Skeeter, can you just remind the people, our listeners, the people, can we our listeners, our watchers, our viewers, the code word for the TAS are two tickets to the Gold Coast Suns uh, game uh, with the team, there and back, return tickets, return airways and two tickets to the game. Can you remind us of the code word if you can remember what it was? Oh, I can remember what it was. I gave you two words and I had to cut it back to one, but we're going with Burley. Burley, that is correct. You need to enter that code word on backchatstudios.com.au for your chance to go into the running to win the tickets. Thanks to our friends at Travel and Sports Australia. G'day, fellas. Firstly, thanks for the advice, Skeeter, on how to deal with my identical twin daughters. So this is from... 
uh, Stephen, who had the twin daughters a little while back. Yeah, good on you, Stephen. Uh, on how to deal with my deal twin daughters. My, the wife wasn't too keen on opening a tab, uh, tab touch account, <laughs> but was happy uh, free shelters are heading into my fridge. So we won the carton that week. Very Apart nice. from having four kids that are six and under, I also suffer from supporting Essendon. <laughs> Stephen's Hang having on. a howl. Uh, yeah, I forgot that he had four kids under the age of six. Yeah, that yeah. Was, bloke, he, he should be in rehab to go down that path. <laughs> after having, I had twins first and that was it. Well, Shut the door. It will be after your advice. Get, get on the punt and get on the piss. <laughs> Scoey, you keep saying yes and aren't good until they are good and they have a losing culture, which I completely agree with. Thank you very much, David. Apart from actually winning a final, which they haven't done since I graduated high school, how can that culture start turning around? What was the mindset the Eagles had from winning a wooden spoon in 2010 and then getting to a grand final a few years later? Also, do Eagles have a better chance of turning their club into a winning culture with veteran players from 2018 or has that ship sailed? Kiss hug. No, kiss, kiss, hug, hug, Stephen. Uh, it's a really good questions there. Um, for Essendon, I think it's got to be based first and foremost on from on-field actions. There's so, so much talking and culture and trademarks and Himalaya hiking and oxygen tanks and things you can do away from the ground. But how you change culture is how you play. Does that sound obvious to you, Skeeter, that changing a culture isn't necessarily about sitting around in meeting rooms and coming up with a trademark to live by? Yes, that's important. But how you um, how you perform and how you lead on the field is the most important thing. So that's why I'm really impressed with Zach Merritt. He just looks like he's almost gone to another level this year, if that's even possible. He, when the game gets hard, he starts tackling harder and chasing. That's the sort of stuff you need. That's how you build winning culture. And then you start winning – and that's where the winning side comes from. But building culture, good culture, may not necessarily mean winning straight up. So West Coast right now and the West Coast side of things has the ship sailed. Well, no, it hasn't. But they need to consistently put games together like they have the last two weeks. That's how you build culture, not the other stuff. Yeah, and look, you've been quite critical of S, and I've sort of backed you up on that. Mm. Bottom line is, we're five rounds through the season. There are three wins, are they? two losses. The Fremantle Dockers, three wins, two losses. Well, who's the better side? Well, Fremantle potentially, but given the way we've talked about Eston, particularly you, would sound like... <laughs> would sound I thought like you the, were saying you were supporting well, me. Well, in part. I'm happy to jump off when <laughs> when things go pear-shaped. Yes. Um, but no, well, to be honest, the evidence is there that they are three wins and two losses. But you're right. I think there's there's lots of holes still there in the second half of the year is when they've tended to fall away. Yes. But as it stands, you know, they've knocked over um, the Bulldogs. They've knocked over... Uh, Killed Killed up by a few points, but not over Hawthorne, which is no great chase. But yeah, I think probably we need to give them a bit of respect what they've done in those three wins. Okay, I'll give them some respect. No worries. I'm not picking them though. G'day, lads. Will here. Hello, Will. Great name. Um, probably the best skater. <laughs> <laughs> you just keep having a chat to yourself and I'll answer the question. <laughs> G'day, lads. Well, yeah, I've got an idea with the review system, which was just deplorable on the weekend, by the way. West oh, Coast game, I was class. laughing on the coverage. National TV, I'm laughing at. Like, was it, Nathan Broad was out in the field laughing at them. Did you hear him? He's like, oh, what a floor, what's going on? I've got an idea with the review system. This is from Will, which could work, like in cricket, where each team gets two reviews instead of the umpire calling for a review. They give the soft call, and if the players want to review it, they can. Um, if the review is correct, they keep it. If it's incorrect, they lose it. This way, we're not having 50 reviews a game because the umps don't want to stuff it up. Yeah. I don't mind it. Yeah, it's yeah, something you know, needs to change. You like it. No, no, I just don't understand it. But uh, well, you get two reviews each. Every every call, every every decision is called a goal or touched or whatever it is. And the two teams have two reviews. But what about the... It's a goal umpires that are calling for... They're, they're the I, ones that are confused know, so, out of, the, out of so their brain. I understand what's happening, but this is a suggestion on how to fix it. And you say you don't understand it. I'm trying to explain it to you. So the umpire, if they're not sure... No, no. Umpire calls the goal no, sorry, point. Sorry, but they're not sure. If they think it's they a goal, like, a goal. Just like they've been doing for 30 years, yes. So yeah, they'll no, make no. a decision. Yes, they make a decision either yes. way. Yes, and then you have two challenges each. If you get it right, you keep your challenge. If you don't, you lose your challenge. And then you might be halfway through the third and no more challenges and the umpire's going to make a decision. I don't mind it in part, but I, I, I just think that... We still want the right this decision. This goes back... Mate. Yeah, the right decision has to be made. But you go if you burn two uh, decisions and then one shock is made late in the game, then I... I mean, this goes back to the Ben Keys thing, surely last year. Yes. At the Adelaide Oval. Yes. So the goal umpires... Are, are literally concerned now about every decision that goes their way. Well, just get it right. 
Well, I, th- I think I think they are trying to, but I think there's also under instruction after what happened then, maybe to to be super cautious. And they went to I think I told you this. They went to the AFL to say, look, you wanted us to go to the review more often. We're doing that now, and people are thinking we're uh, incompetent knobs by not being able to make a call. Right. Um. And we've seen it. A ball's a meter inside the line or goal line, a meter over the line, and they're still calling for review. This is something I think needs some clarity from the AFL to say why is this so. Shelter Footy cast uh, a couple of incompetent knobs <laughs> in this one. I think Margaret Footy cast. Uh, <laughs> that's right. Last one. I think Tom Barras's most recent interview is the best West Coast content to come out of the footy club in a long time. All well, that interviews are pretty bland and don't give you anything. This guy is such a good speaker. It gives you so much about him and the boys in the interview. As a West Coast fan, I think the club is in good spirits. Just a comment there, more, less oh, of a question. Having um, been at his press conferences, interviewed him, he, and you know him uh, far better than I, but he is a deep thinker. He's He thinks before he speaks, which is something we should actually <laughs> we should follow <laughs> in his path. But he's articulate. He's obviously an intelligent fella. Uh, hence, he's regarded very highly at the club. Skeeter, I'm going to give you carton away for the best email, if that's okay with you. Footycast at shelterbrewing.com.au. You scrap that. Stop sending emails there because it means Tom has to send them on to me and I'm sick of it. This is the email footycast at backchatstudios.com.au. If you want to be in a chance to uh, get a slab, send out your way, send one in there, if it features on the show, and we think it's the best. We'll send out a slab. Seeing as though Stephen with the Twins has already got one, I really like Will's suggestion on the goal review. review. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's, it's trying to find a solution to a problem that uh, no one seems to have the answer for. Footycast at backchatstudios.com.au. Will, well done. We'll get a slab out to you, Skeeter. That is us done and dusted. Make sure you get your tickets to the Backchat Ale relaunch. If you haven't got them, they'll sell out. Skeeter, it's not a joke. It's not a lie. They'll sell out. I've been told by the venue that we're very close to capacity and we can't go over capacity. And if you think I'm joking, you can stand on security and you can chat You can chat to people as they come in and out. Would you like that? We'll no, no, I just I just can't imagine people want to listen to us Muppets talk uh, on a Thursday night. But if they are, we welcome you. Quick shout out to Ash Little, all the boys that came with us to Steve last week for yes. a bit of a luncheon. Sharon Wellingham, you and I had a very pleasant time. They're big fans of Shelter and uh, and uh, the footy cast. And uh, may uh, we catch up with him shortly and uh, I can be drinking. Very good. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week.